Yep, family. Kaba Hiawatha. Kamene. And I know that we have put um, the conversation to be around Santa Claus. And we are going to talk a little bit about that. But I, I really did not want to focus on that. Uh, you know, the, the story of Santa Claus uh, coming up out of uh, uh, Holland uh, amongst the Dutch people. Uh, it's it's uh, a, a very long story. But first, family, it's it was a story that came from the Moors. It uh, the clothing was the Moors. In in so many ways, when you look at the uh, the hat or the the headpiece that Santa Claus wears, you can see that it's 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 a derivation of the fez. Uh, you can. And I could spend a lot of time doing a lot of different comparisons. Well, let's just look at one thing. Let's let's look at the word. Because Santa Claus really is the Dutch way of saying St. Nicholas. Um, Santa Claus, that we have gotten from Santa Claus comes Santa Claus. And Santa Claus is St. Nicholas. Santa Claus. It, the, word, the word is there. But let me just touch on this for a minute so you can get a sense of this. So, St. Nicka, Nigga, wait a minute, that sounds very familiar to me. Nicka, Las. You, you can't lose the sound and how our history and culture has been taken, rearranged, many times contaminated, because of the nature of it. But I really wanted to look at Santa Claus's partner. As you can see on the Instagram that uh, we put up, you notice that there are short black people. At the same time, you know that Santa Claus has elves. But you also know that the first people on the planet were a short-statured African people known as the Twa Mbuti, or who derogatorily are called pygmies. They are the original family. They are the original human beings. They are the people from whom the, um, the Kushites came from, uh, the Kemites, the Egyptians came from. Uh, they lived at the same time, and they still live today in the central southern regions of Africa. They're still here. And not only that, but they are also, uh, they, they also fanned across the globe. The short-statured people came into existence somewhere at the, somewhere at the more formative time of the Homo sapiens sapiens in Africa. You know, my book, Spirituality Before Religions, gives you the historical context of it, so I really don't want to spend this time getting into the historical context of them, but just for you to know that they were a short-statured people, somewhere between maybe three foot eight, could have been a little bit shorter, maybe three foot, uh, three foot six to about, their towering giants were five foot one. And they lived uh, from about, I would say, uh, maybe 150,000 years ago, they came into fruition. They came into their, their consciousness. And they began to create civilization. And they moved across Africa, central, south, to the west, to the north, to the east. And they followed the river systems. They were a river people. And the, the oldest tools found, along with things to crush, were, were things that had to do with fishing. So they were a fishing people. And so, when the Celtic Druids, who are the Africans, got into Ireland and England and established their civilization there, there were no Europeans existing at this time, family. I just want you to know that. In fact, the people that were moving there, they would become the future Europeans, the Africans. They would become. The Europeans. There were no Europeans on the planet at this time. There were no Asians on the planet at this time. And who is the leprechaun? 
in the the Irish folktale. Well, they are the Twa and Booty people. They're green because of the nature of the Asarian drama, which we'll talk a little bit about as we move through this conversation. And that's basically who you're dealing with right now. You're you're dealing with a short statured people and the leprechaun and what was it? The rainbow. And the rain at the end of the rainbow, what was it? Gold. There's no gold in Ireland, so they could not have been doing it from Ireland. So it was a folktale brought from Africa into the northern regions, such as Ireland and England. L- let me stop here and just to tell you this family. Uh, uh, when someone tells a perfect lie, the truth is unbelievable. And as we're watching in this current administration in these past four years, what you're noticing is that the methodology that are, that is used is to continually tell you a lie in your face constantly. And pretty soon, the neurons in your brain pick up the rhythm of the untruth, of the lie. And some minds who are not strong enough go with the lie. Some minds who are distracted go with the lie, and pretty soon the lie becomes the truth. When someone tells a perfect lie, the truth is unbelievable. These past four years have shown us, has demonstrated for us exactly how this has happened. Because when new, intro, new information is introduced to the human mind, And this goes contrary to everything they've ever believed. Even if the information is in their favor, they've become comfortable with accepting the untruth. The truth creates a disharmony. It's called cognitive dissonance. Cognitive is what you know. Dissonance is an unsettling feeling. So cognitive dissonance, because what I'm speaking with you about and what I speak to other people about because of my my research in terms of looking deeper into the story itself, two things happen to the mind when introduced to information like this. When you get cognitive dissonance, one, you, you either ferociously fight the new information because you're too comfortable believing what you've learned to believe or you alter your thought process. And of course, there's all things in between the two, but basically there's two choices. You either uh, zero in on what you believe, no matter what anybody says, don't confuse me because I believe the lie. Or the people say, wait a minute, That sounds right. That's why I try to approach this scientifically. That's why when we talk about St. Nicholas, I say, well, just listen to the word, nigga. Nika. Nger. The derivation of most of the great African words in Africa, negus, negusti, naga. You can go to India, naga. The nger sound is very strong in the community, and it's right here for us to see. I'm not encouraging using the word. I'm not saying don't use the word. I'm not saying use the word. I'm just saying understand the etymological and the phonon, the sound of the word, to understand the connection between St. Nicholas and Africa. But it's Jvata Pete that you want to look at. Jvata Pete is that short-statured elf where white people put blackface on and I, I was scheduled to go to Holland to talk to the community, and they were very upset. They wanted to bring me in during the holiday season and wanted me to talk about it. And um, things didn't quite work out um, for me to get there for that. I, I eventually got there in March, but I didn't get there for this holiday. But they said, what should, you know, what would you, what would you do? I would say, and what I told them is, I say, get your best comedians your very best comedians and drive that mythology into the ground. Make everybody laugh. Because the worst thing that you could do to someone who wishes to oppress you is to laugh at them and not with them. Make them the butt of your joke and not the method of your joke. 
That was the genius of Richard Pryor. The genius of Paul Mooney. And all of the other comedians, and even today's comedians also. Today a little bit different. They're, it's a little bit different. Not going to go in there. But I'm talking about Richard Pryor and Paul Mooney and what they did with comedy and humor. And what so many Red Fox and Moms Maybelline. You know, uh, uh, they're, 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 there are many to go into the past. But the, the point I'm making is that much of what I'm saying to you, you may never have heard before. It may be something that never touched your mind before. And, and that is because for them to be successful in holding you down, they must get you to believe the lie. There are three things that someone, along with everything else that I say, the method of controlling a people is for them to tell you a myth or a lie. The second step is to get you to believe the lie. And then the third step is to get you to form the habit of believing the lie. And while it's the last form, it's always the hardest to get rid of. Because people can become comfortable living a lie. People can become comfortable being a slave. Because at least you know what you are. But when someone comes and introduces information to you, you say, wait, 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 no, no, you're not that. <laughs> In fact, you come from a great culture and a great civilization that has done a lot of things. And then all of that, all of a sudden, that person who has become comfortable in being a slave or slave-minded then realizes that they have a responsibility. And responsibility is two words, not one. Responsibility is the response to your abilities. And that means that you have to do something. You no longer can sit by and just let everybody else do it, even if you have nothing to do with it. Now you have to get up and do something. And some people have become very comfortable sitting and doing nothing, even if they have no power. There are others that once they hear this, they say, I'm up, I'm getting up out of here. And so when we look at this, story of Santa Claus and Zwarte Piet. Zwarte. It spells Z-W-A-R-T-E. It means black. Zwarte. Black. It's powerful. It's a powerful thought. And Zwarte Piet really is the hero. Because even with Santa Claus, it's the elves that allow Santa to do what he does. Because if everybody, if the elves were to strike and say, we ain't doing nothing, Santa would not be on the road on December 25th. But even Santa Claus, Sinterklaas, Saint Nicholas, was black. And the tradition of giving candy and toys to children came from Moorish Spain. Even in the story, Zvatsa Piet was said to have come from Spain. Just look at the story. Don't believe a word I say. Research this for yourself so that you can understand who you are and what you've done and what you've contributed. And other people have taken your thing, stamped themselves on it, and make you think they created it. You know, the second day of Kwanzaa is Kujichagulia, self-determination. And... It was said by great scholar Dr. Wade Nobles that power is the ability to define someone's reality and have that person accept that definition as if it were their own. Like somebody say, you a slave. And all of a sudden you start believing that you the one that said, I'm a slave. It's not even like someone else accused you. You accept the fact that, that you made that up. Yeah, I'm a slave. You, you own your own servitude. This, this is where we are. This is what has happened psychologically to us as a people. And so I wanted to talk about the Twa Mbuti, the short-statured people, the leprechaun, the green, the, fo the forever resurrection being green, the symbol of resurrection, the leprechaun with the gold at the end of the rainbow. The rainbow is the collection of all colors that you can see. Because that's all we can see, by the way. Our, our eyes really only allow us to see from, from infrared to ultraviolet. 
that's our color spectrum. That's what our eyes are based on. We have rods and cones in our eyes. The rods are for the black and white visions. And the cones are for the color visions. This is science. This is why I like science. Knowledge. So that you're not emotional in the things that you're saying. You're, you're dropping the science so that people can walk through. And not just that. You can go to books that can somewhat verify what I say. Not that I'm saying believe the books. Because there are things written in books that ain't true. So... It's not that I'm saying, I'm just saying that there's a point of reference. I'm not coming from emotion. I'm not coming from an esoteric level telling you something. What I'm coming to you with is some, something that I may have studied, I've researched, and I presented to you. And then I give you the books that you can read, which is on my website. If you go to kabakamane.com, I have my free study guide there that has the uh, references, the books, and the things. So it's there. And that's the way it is. But now, Let's get a little bit deeper and let's talk about what happened yesterday. One of the reasons why I encouraged my team and I to uh, postpone the, uh, this uh, Instagram Live today as opposed to yesterday is because we went through something yesterday, which was absolutely phenomenal. It was something that our ancestors, probably in Africa, celebrated. The Dogon, the Kemites, the Kush, the Twa Mbuti, they celebrated it. It was a sign. And they saw it as a sign. Yesterday, in the southwest heavens, planets aligned. Saturn and Jupiter aligned. Don't think that doesn't have an effect on the Earth. Everything that happens in our solar system, the soul, our solar system is like a solar family. Every planet, every asteroid, every meteor, everything in it is related to each other, like a family. Be you mother, father, sister, brother, cousin, aunt, uncle, everybody's related. And whatever happens in our solar system, impacts every entity in the solar system. Our ancestors understood that. That's why their cosmology, as above, so below. When these two planets aligned, it was a rod. The last time they aligned this way, the way they aligned yesterday, was somewhere around the time when Abu Bakari II traveled to America from West Africa. It was around the same time that Mansa Musa sojourned over east into Kemet and broke the World Bank. This brother gave out so much gold, he broke the World Bank. We can't even fathom how wealthy he was because there's no words to describe the kind of wealth that he had. No aliens. There's, there's no aliens. <laughs> there's no concept of aliens. Billionaire, millionaire, trillionaire. There's no concept because he was off the chart. There was no way. The way we measure wealth today is an illusion. It really doesn't exist. It's somewhere between that paper money and coin money and the stock exchange. None of it ever measures true wealth. This is where we are, family. Maybe causing some cognitive dissonance, but let's drop it like it's hot so that we can deal with 2021. Because along with those stars aligning, uh, my bad, the planets aligning, Jupiter and Saturn, okay? Jupiter is closer to us than Saturn. It, it comes, well, the way the planets are, I always remembered it with the acronym. I used to always teach to the children. My my very educated mother, comma, just served us nine pickles. Some people say pizzas. It don't make a difference if it's pizza or pickle. Pluto's not a planet. Pluto is a moon. A very special entity that is out there in our solar system. It's not a planet. First of all, it couldn't be a planet because it's so small. See, when you go from my very educated mother just served us nine pickles, you have Mercury, Venus, 
Earth, Mars, okay, my very educated mother, Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, comma. Now that comma is very important because that comma is what separates the inner planets from the outer planets, which is the asteroid belt. And there's a reason why that's there. A lot of the reason why there's life on Earth has to do with everything that has to do with where these planets and these asteroids are, 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 are located. Because everything, as you move out of the asteroid belt, all of those next planets are all gas giants. All the four I just mentioned to you, Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars, those are all small, solid uh, planets. The asteroid belt comes and separates, just like a comma, separates the phrase before to the phrase after. Everything after are all gas giants. Jupiter just served us nine pickles. You got Jupiter served Saturn, uh, Uranus, okay, Neptune, and then Pluto. But Pluto, not a planet. But I got to come back and do something on that. That's a, a totally separate conversation. If you really want some deep information, Dr. Neil deGrasse Tyson, uh, the director of the planetarium in New York, he, he wrote an article about Pluto. <laughs> and I mean, everybody, do you know why they still teach that Pluto is a planet? They know it's not. But do you know why? Do you know how much money it would cost to change all the books? That's why they don't change it. That's why they keep making you think that Pluto is a planet, because they don't want to um, change the books. So they got you believing that this Pluto is, is smaller than our moon. And it's hard and crusty. If Pluto were really a planet out there, it could not be small and it could not be crusty it has to be a moon of some kind or some type of other celestial body but it cannot be a planet that's just science you know i'm i'm not running no other story on you it's too small and it's too hard because they're all the other four jupiter saturn uranus and neptune they're all gas giants so you got to put that out the way so when you're dealing with this magnificent occurrence current yesterday, with the aligning of the planets, the aligning of the planets are very important. The same way the Dogon looked at Sirius B and Sirius A, those are stars, of course. But whenever anything aligns, it means it's an introduction to something else because of the nature of the impact it's going to have on its surrounding environment. But not just that. It happened on the winter solstice, where the days and nights stood still. See, that's the second astronomical occurrence. And when you begin to look at all of this, you understand why our ancestors were so prolific in everything they did, because they knew. And they didn't know just because it was something that psychically came to them. They knew because they studied and they knew science. And science is knowledge, wisdom, and understanding. You know, ain't no children's story about Santa Claus on a, on a, 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 a chariot with reindeers flying in the air. What kind of story is this? I heard the other day they said, don't worry about Santa Claus this year because he got the uh, uh, the vaccination. <laughs> okay, so you're doing it for the children, I understand. I believed in Santa Claus until I was five years old. So, I mean, and how many of us believed in Santa? You know, it's just, a, look, we're human beings. We went through this, you know. But once you know better, <laughs> you got to do better. And so we're here now with this second phenomenon of the winter solstice where you see solstice means stand still so equinox means equal okay the days and nights are equal the solstice means that in the heavens the the sun not the sun but the planets because the sun is stationary but they stood still and when they stood still okay 
it means that now we, every day, starting today, today was longer as a day than it was a night. When we had the autumnal equinox, it meant that there were 12 hours of day, 12 hours of night. And that we then started heading towards every day, it became darker earlier. Until yesterday. And then, starting yesterday, every day now is going to get longer until you get to the spring equinox, meaning equal. And then that means from that point on, every day, every day will be longer than the night until you get to June when you have the summer solstice, which means that you have 12 hours of day, 12 hours of night. And then from the summer solstice to the autumnal equinox, the days begin to get shorter. So yesterday was the solstice. Every day from this point on, it'll stay lighter, a couple of seconds longer every day, minutes until we get to a certain point, which is in June, the longest day. Yesterday was the shortest day of our year in terms of uh, daylight. When we get to the other solstice, the summer solstice, it will revert, mean the same thing, but it's just in reverse. This is the way our plan. This is summertime in Australia now. Because of the 23 and a third angle of the sun, the sun's direct rays now are on the southern part of the equator. When it comes back around during the summertime, they will go into winter in the south, and we will go into summer or warm weather. Science. That's the second phenomenon that happened. But now there's a third one coming. And this third one happens every year. But we celebrate it a different way. And that is, if you look to your southeast, you look up into the heavens, you see the brightest star. That's Sirius. If you look down to the left of that star, you'll see three stars. Those are the three stars that we call the Belt of Orion. Now, those three stars, if you go through D, 3D, you got to do this. If you go down, that is the reflection of the three pyramids, Khufu, Khafra, and Menkara of Giza in Egypt. Because those three stars are aligned with those three stars in the heaven in order to chart Sirius. They call Sopet. This science family. And African people did this. Melanated. Kinky hair, curly hair, nappy hair, whatever you want to say. Wide nose, thick lip, deep brown to indigo blue. People did this. They charted the heavens. And they built structures in reflection to all the heavenly bodies that they saw. Now, this star Sirius is rising. And it's rising up off the horizon. And in January, because for some people, the 25th of December is not the most important day. For some people, the most important day in the calendar year for them spiritually is January 6th. But that's an astronomical phenomenon. In Spanish, it's called El Día de Reyes. In English, it's the Day of the Kings or Three Kings Day. Where... These three stars, along with this one star, is going to rise up into the heavens and going to situate itself right there. And it's going to look like these three stars are visiting Sirius. Which is the story of January 6th, or the Epiphany, where the three magi visit the Christ child. And where do they visit him? Where is he said to be? I saw it on TV. They said, we ain't got no room in the inn. But we got a little stall in the manger. Well, guess what the constellation is called where Sirius is situated? It's called the manger. It's the constellation that's called the manger. It's a phenomenal story when you come and think about it. 
<laughs> but now I see time. I always try to keep this 20 minutes to 30 minutes, fam, because I just like to come out, talk to you for a little while, and give back. But we're coming into a situation now. We're going into 2021. There's a chance I won't do another Panther Code until 2021. So I just want to drop a couple more things with you, which is the Asarian drama is an African story. It's, an, it's the original African drama that we can now look to and see a trace of intellectual growth spiritual aspiration and the ability for a people to reflect on themselves and tell a story that would mark the way in which human beings should live their life as divine humans this is what the asarian drama is okay let me just cut through the story if you want to know the asarian drama just go see lion king because that that is the same story i'm about to tell you they they, they just made them lions <laughs> And they told the story because they can't put human beings and tell stories about great African kings. So, you know, I mean, they don't mind doing it with Cinderella. They don't mind doing it with, with Little Red Riding Hood. They don't mind doing it with all these other stories. They can do humans. But when it comes to being great as kings and queens, it's very difficult for them to envision human beings like that. So they got to make them animals. But the story still remains the same. Okay. The evil brother, Set, kills Asar with his 72 Sebau, or what's called the dark deceased, the forces of evil. They come in and they, they kill Asar, the good brother. This is where Cain and Abel come from. The good brother. And what they do is they don't want him to ever be able to be put together again. So what they do is that they put him in a tree. See, the first story is that they put him in a tree. And in this tree, Asar's wife, Aset, and her oracle reading sister, Nebetet, through the help of Tehuti, find out that Asar is hidden in a tree. So Tehuti, to let As Aset and Nebetet know where to get As Asar's body back, to be able to identify the particular tree in the forest where Asar's body is, guess what Tehuti does? He puts a star on the top of the tree. And you get to that. So, family, here's what I'm saying. They stole St. Nick from us. They told untruths about Svata Pete, trying to make it like a, a, a white people in blackface. They have no idea about stars as it relates to the true meaning. And here they are. They're going to take our Christmas tree with a star on top. And now we don't want to celebrate our holiday. Christmas is ours. The tree with all the lights. What do you think all those lights are? Stars in the heavens. What's all the decorations? All of the beauty that has been placed in our existence. And what's at the bottom of the tree that is to be opened on a particular day? That's us. We are the gifts of the cosmic universe. That's our story. It's such a beautiful story that they done messed up. And so people say, do you celebrate Christmas? Yeah, I do. Not as it is. Do you celebrate Kwanzaa? Oh, yes, I do. I celebrate Kwanzaa. That's fun. I celebrate everything. Because human beings deserve to live life and to enjoy when you can. And you don't have to celebrate it the way they say it's supposed to be. If you're getting together with your family, which this year, mm, be careful, family. There's something out there. They don't already told you that this thing is morphed. That's the purpose of a virus is to morph. Because it's trying to get in. And we trying to keep it out. And it's trying to get in. <laughs> and we trying to keep it out. 
But all of these celebrations are meant to be with family in whatever way, whether you can FaceTime or you can Zoom or whatever you choose to do. Just understand these are our celebrations. And when we had them, we knew how to celebrate. We even know how to celebrate to this very day. We still celebrate, even in all that we go. And keep this in mind also. Yesterday was a very important day on the plantation. Because yesterday was the day that the great majority of Underground Railroad participants started their trek to the north. Because what did they know? They knew that they had more time to travel. Why? Because it was darker, longer. Christmas gift. You know what Christmas gift was? Christmas gift was a phrase we had when we were on the plantation. That if we said it first, it was our pleasure to give you a gift. Christmas was a time, it was the pleasure not to receive, but to give. It's called Christmas gift. I read an article in Ebony Magazine about that. I also read an article in Ebony Magazine about the Underground Railroad and why yesterday was so important. Because that's when everybody got up and got the hell off the plantation, heading for freedom. And by the spring, they were north. Following what? The North Star, Polaris, and its, and its environs. This is our holiday family. This is who we are as a people. But as you celebrate Kwanzaa, understand every day leads to the next one. Dr. Maulana Karenga ingeniously put those days together in a way that you have to start off with emoja. You have to start off with unity. Unity, not just with other people. The first unity got to be with yourself. You have to reconcile yourself. All of us have to reconcile ourselves. Forgive us our trespass as we forgive those who trespass against us. You have to forgive yourself in order to move on. Correct it, but move on. Moja, unity, is the first day of Kwanzaa. And once you unite with yourself, you then can know yourself and you can image who you are which is self-determination. You determine for yourself who you are because you know who you are because you are united with yourself. And then after you define who you are, you then can go to Ujima. Collective work and responsibility. Collective work. We work together. And how we collectively work is to respond to our ability and our contributions to the movement forward of people. And after you do that, you move to the fourth day, Ujama, cooperative economics. Now, economics ain't money. Echo comes from the word oikos. It's a Greek word, oikos, O-I-K-O-S. It means environment or home. Knowledge of home, economics is knowledge of home, ecology is study of your environment or your home, economy is the knowledge of your home to know your environment, to understand the wealth that the creator has given you, and to collectively work together to the response of your ability because you have self-determined that you are united. You see how all these days come together, they, they fit together. And then after you have known your environment, then you find your purpose, your divine purpose, Nia. That's your purpose. And when you find your purpose, you creatively construct your life, Kuumba, which is creativity. And then you move to your last day, Imani, to have faith. Faith in yourself, faith in your family, faith in your community, faith in your nation, however big or small it may be. Those are the days of Kwanzaa. Those are the principles of life. But every one of them is practiced for the children, for those yet to be born. That's what we're here for. That is what we have to do. 
The, the planets and the stars have a line family. We've gone through 2020 on the way into the age of Aquarius, the age of the feminine energy. And to brothers and sisters, I wish you all happy Kwanzaa. If you celebrate Christmas, I wish you a Merry Christmas. <laughs> no, it's not a new year. It's just a continuation of a whole nother conceptual framework. The old is going out and the new is coming in. The old that's going out is white supremacy. And the new that's coming in is black power. All power to the people family. I wish you the very best. I know we're on our way as we speak. So you just keep on keeping on. Because it ain't over till we win. Hotep family. Happy days.